Okay, if you'll take your seats, we'll proceed in a minute. And it looks like we're ready for Greg. Born in, Char Born in Charlie, I have a follow-up on the railroad business. By nearly all measures, BNSF had a solid year in 2018. Full-year revenue growth of 11.5% was better than the 7.5% top-line growth of Union Pacific, which is BNSF's largest uh, direct competitor, uh, came up with. With Burlington Northern seeing both larger increases in average revenue per car unit and total volumes than its closest peer. Even so, Burlington Northern once again fell short of Union Pacific when it came to profitability with its operating ratio declining 130 basis points to 66.9%, while Union Pacific's ratio fell only 120 basis points to 627 further cementing the spread that exists between the two companies' margins at more than 400 basis points. Can you explain what is driving the difference in profitability between Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, as theoretically we should not see that wide of a spread between two similar-sized companies that are basically competing for the same business with the same customers in the western half of the United States. And while you noted that Burlington Northern is in a wait and see mode with regards to precision schedule railroading, we've kind of heard the same line historically with regards to Geico's approach to telematics. And what worries me here is that the potential now exists for a much wider gap to emerge between profitability levels at Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, which has recently adopted a version of PSR, some of which Union Pacific could eventually use to get more price competitive. Well, Warren knows the answer to that a lot better than I do. My guess is that they work a little harder than we do at building the rates. But, uh, Warren, you answer that. Yeah, well, we, it's true that we, we receive the lowest ton-mile revenue of any of the six big railroads in uh, North America and... Uh, uh, there's some explanation for that, obviously, a significant explanation uh, in the particular types of hauls we have and that sort of thing. We do have longer hauls generally. But the answer, uh, Union Pacific's profit margin, they, they, they talk about operating ratios, but that goes back to the Interstate Commerce Commission. It's really profit margin, pre-tax, pre-interest profit margin. <clears throat> and the Union Pacific... Uh, at one time, uh, probably uh, 15 or maybe a little more years ago, they, they really uh, uh, went off the track, so to speak. Uh, but they've done a, uh, a very good job of getting, uh, well, they got a lot of uh, underpriced coal contracts worked out, as, as did we. Um, but they've also, they've, they've, they've done a very good job on expenses, and, and uh, uh, there's no fundamental reason why the BNSF uh, franchise, I always like the Western Railroads better than the Eastern, I'm not by a dramatic margin, but I, I, I think the West will do better in terms of ton miles over time in the eastern roads. And uh, we've got some great routes, uh, some of which were underwater in March for a while. And uh, uh, we pay a lot of attention uh, to what's going on at the Union Pacific, as we should. And, and the, the uh, the future, it's not like we're losing business to anybody, but we, they have been operating uh, at more efficiently, in effect, uh, than we have during the last few years. And uh, like I say, we take notice of it. They've, they've cut a lot of people, I mean, in, right here at Omaha. And uh, uh, we'll see what that does in terms of passenger, or, or, or in terms of shipper satisfaction. But we are measuring ourselves very carefully against what they do, and, and if, it, if changes are needed, we'll, we'll do them. It's a, we've got a wonderful asset in that business, and when I bought it, 
I said it's for 100 years. It's for a lot more than 100 years. It is a very, very fundamental business. And uh, we've got a wonderful uh, franchise, and we should uh, have margins comparable to other railroads. Really? I don't know much about it. <laughs> Station 9. Hi, Warren and Charlie. My name is Rob Lee from Vancouver, Canada. Um, could you please share with us what do you value the most in life now? Thank you. Well, well I'd like to have a little more of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the two things you can't buy, time and love. And that, uh, I value those for a long time. And, and I've been very, very, very lucky in life in being able to control my own time to extreme degree. Charlie's always valued that too. That's, that's why we really wanted to have money was so we could do what we damn pleased basically in our life. <laughs> it wasn't six houses or boats or anything. But, well, Charlie's got a boat, but it, it doesn't do us that much good. But, but time uh, is valuable and that's, that's uh, and we are very, very lucky to be in jobs where physical ability doesn't make any difference and you know we, we, we've got the perfect job for a couple of guys with aging bodies and uh, we get to do what we love to do every day. I mean I literally, uh, I, I could do anything that money could buy pretty much and uh, I'm having more fun doing what I do than doing anything else and Charlie is designing, designing dormitories and I mean he, he's got an interesting life and, and uh, he brings a lot to it. He still reads, you know, more books in a, in a week than I get done in a month, and he remembers what he reads. And so we've got it very good, but we, we don't have unlimited time. And, and whatever we do to free up the time to do what we like to do, and we both maximize that in our lives, uh, we do. Anybody's lucky if he gets so what he spends his time at, he really likes doing. That's, that's a blessing. Yeah, we, we've had so much good luck in life. It's, it, it, it sort of blows your mind, it's, it's starting with being, being born in the United States. And uh, Canada would be fine, too, incidentally. I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Carol? Um, this question is from Brian Neal, who writes from the Mayo Clinic education site. Berkshire owns approximately $200 billion in publicly traded stocks. I appreciate the disclosure of Berkshire's holdings, but I am disappointed by the lack of specific performance information. Since investing in publicly owned stocks is so much a part of Berkshire's business, why do you not tell us every year how our portfolio performed? Well, I would say it could be calculated fairly easily, and, and it is, it's about 40% of Berkshire's value, but 60% is the businesses. And, and if you look at the top 10 stocks, I would guess, the, you know, you're, you're down to where beyond those 10 stocks, you're talking about less than probably less than 10% of Berkshire's uh, value. So I, again, we, we're not in the business of explaining why we own a stock. We're not looking for people to compete to buy it. We have a portfolio of companies where I would say that of that 200 billion or so, at least 150 billion of them are buying in their stock and increasing our interest every year. And why in the world should we want to uh, tell a whole bunch of people to go out and buy those stocks so that we end up paying, or the company on our behalf ends up paying more money for them? I mean, it, it, uh, people get, get very happy when their stocks go up. But if we're going to own whatever, whether it's uh, 
uh, Bank of America, whether it's Apple, whether it's any of the big holdings, uh, we will do considerably better in the next 10 years if their stocks do terribly during certain periods and that they buy lots of stock in. It's just exactly like buying it ourselves, except we're using their, uh, they're, they're, they're using our money, but it, uh, it, it's so elementary. Uh, and why in the world would we want to go out and tell the world that, that these stocks should go up uh, so that maybe they can sell or something when it costs us money and we're not going to, we're not going to be able to move in and out of the stocks to our advantage. So, uh, our, our holdings are filed quarterly, our domestic holdings, as was pointed out earlier, filed quarterly, but we are, we would rather not tell the world what we own anymore that we'd like to tell them what our strategy is at NetJets or what our, you know, what we're going to do at Lubrizol and what we're working on the way of, of uh, better uh, advance, advances in, in, in additives or whatever it may be or where we plan to build a new store for the furniture mart or something. That's proprietary information and we have to disclose a certain amount, but we're certainly not going to be touting our the stocks to the other people. And, in terms of calculating our performance, you can take the top 10 or 12 stocks and anybody can make the calculation. At the end of the year, the Wall Street Journal runs, or all the papers run something where it says a year-to-date performance or something of the sort. So that's a simple calculation. Charlie? I've got nothing to add to that. Okay. Jonathan. No one's ever asked a question about flight safety, but perhaps this year is somewhat topical given the 737 MAX controversy. The New York Times spoke to engineers who said that Boeing explicitly designed the MAX in a manner that allowed airline customers to avoid paying for simulators to train their pilots. Do you expect the worldwide regulatory and commercial response to the MAX's problems to result in increased demand for flight safety simulators? And could you please more generally discuss flight safety's competitive position and growth prospects? Yeah, well, flight, flight safety is, there especially would be with corporate pilots. They train, they train the net, our, our NetJets pilots, for example. They have a major facility with simulators for that. Uh, uh, I don't think what's happened with the 737 MAX will have any particular effect. I mean, we, we have, I don't know how many of the Fortune 100 companies that we do business with, it's, but it's a very significant percentage, and they train their pilots uh, with flight safety because we've got the talent and the simulators uh, like nobody else has for that business. And uh, Charlie, my, didn't you have that friend of yours that was trying to get out Yoshi to pass him when he shouldn't? Well, you remember that story of your your friend that wanted to have flight safety? Oh yes. Yeah, credit. Why don't you tell me? I mean, Al Yoshi, who started flight safety with a few thousand dollars and a, a little little visual simulator or whatever it may have been at LaGuardia. I mean, he really cared about saving lives, and he 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 made a lot of money in the process, but. He was dedicated uh, throughout his lifetime to, uh, to truly uh, train better pilots and, 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 and uh, reduce the chance of, of accidents dramatically. It was a, it was a mission with him. And, and that, that spirit still continues. And, and as I say, we've got a, I can't tell you the percentages, I don't know, but I know it's very high of the of certainly the corporate business. We have, a lot, we have government business, we have, we have some airline business and all of that, but uh, uh, I don't expect any great change in the flight training business. But tell, tell them about your friend, Charlie. Well, of course, people pass those tests with flying colors and they, some of them just barely pass. And one of my friends just barely passed and they called me and told me it's uh, this is an art in the business. Flight safety would not. They care about everything. They, care. they watch the details. They care. And it's a, those simulators can, they can cost over $10 million. I mean, just, it, uh, 
uh, and they're dedicated, obviously, to a given, a, a given uh, uh, model of plane. You might find it interesting at NetJets, at NetJets, our pilots only fly one model. I mean, at, uh, most charters and all those, I'm sure they, and it's like they, they could fly other models and all of that, but we, we just want them, we want them to be flying one model and we give them a maximum amount of training annually. And it's, when I bought the company for Berkshire and I think it was 1998 or thereabouts, uh, you know, the thought obviously uh, bothered me that I would have a significant percentage of the people would be friends of mine that were using it and, you know, and, and uh, you'd hate to have anything happen. I use it, my family uses it, uh, our managers use it, and uh, uh, there's nobody that cares more about safety. But I don't see them than at NetJets. It's, it's a first-class operation in, in many, never many years. never killed a passenger. No. They had one pilot who hit a glider at 16,000 feet, and it was kind of a difficult landing. It was more they, than a difficult landing. They never killed a pilot. It was a woman pilot, yeah. She was, and, and she was flying the next day. The co-pilot was kind of taken out of operation for a while. But this woman ended up almost with a control panel in her lap because this guy had turned off his battery uh, and, and uh, hit one of our hawkers. And she had one shot at the runway, and... And she brought it in, and and uh, we've got we've had some remarkable, remarkable uh, training and pilots there. And, uh, you should ask for her if you're flying on that jet. <laughs> Station ten. Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. Hi, my name is Daphne. I'm from New York, and I'm nine years old. And I'm excited to be at the Berkshire meeting, and this is my third year. Wow. <laughs> you should be rich by now. <laughs> you have often said that investors are well served by identifying business with a wide moat where the castle behind the moat is run by a king or queen who can be trusted to make good decisions. In the past, you have applied this advice by investing in businesses with world class strong brands such as Coke, American Express, and C's, as well as media companies that has helped these brands protect and widen their moats, such as Cap Cities, ABC, and the Washington Post. In the past, you have also generally avoided investing in technology companies, pointing out how quickly technology changes and how hard it is to build a circle of competence in it. Today, we seem to be in a world where some of the most dominant companies in the world are technology companies, and we have built powerful platforms such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft in America, and Alibaba and Tencent in China. These companies all have wide moats, strong brands, and are led by brilliant and <laughs> entrepreneurs. That's good. <laughs> my, my question to you is this. If Berkshire is to honor its tradition of investing in wide modes and strong brands, and especially in companies that are also capital efficient, do you think that Berkshire needs to expand its investing lens to include more of these leading technology platforms? In other words, do you believe that you need to adapt your model of wide moats and strong brands to embrace, not avoid, technology? I think the answer is maybe. Uh, I, 
I think the answer is to put her on the board and it'll bring down the average age enormously. We won't get criticized as much. Uh, the, you're, you're exactly right in that uh, we do like moats and we used to be able to identify them in a, in a newspaper that was the only newspaper in town or, or in TV stations where we, where we uh, felt the dominant positions and we felt the, the, uh, the product was underpriced in terms of advertising. Uh, we saw it in brands sometimes. Uh, and it is true that, that in the tech world, if you can build a moat, it can be incredibly uh, valuable. I've not felt the confidence that I was the best one to judge that in many cases. It, uh, it wasn't hard to figure out who was winning at any given time or what their business was about, but there were a huge number of people that knew more about the game than I did. And we don't want to try and win in a game we don't understand. We may hire people, such as Ted and Todd, that are, are better at understanding certain uh, uh, areas of investing uh, than I am, or maybe even Charlie is. Uh, but you're, the principles haven't changed. You're right that some of the old ones have lost their moat. And you're, you're right that there are going to be companies in the future that have them that will be enormously valuable. And we hope we can identify one every now and then. But we won't, we'll still stay within what we, where we think we know what we're doing. And obviously we'll make mistakes even within that area. But we won't go into something because somebody else tells us it's a good thing to do. I mean, we, we, we are not going to subcontract your money somebody else's judgment. You can take your money and, and follow somebody else's judgment, but we're not in the, we're not in the business of, of thinking that if we hire 10 people with specialties in this area or that, that it will lead to superior investment results. And we do worry that we may, we could blow a lot of money that way. So we'll do our best to, to enlarge the circle of competence of the people at Berkshire so that we don't miss so many, but we'll, we we'll miss a lot in the future. We missed a lot in the past. The main thing to do is to find things where our batting average is going to be high. And if we miss the biggest ones, that really doesn't bother us as long as as long as the things we do with money work out okay. Charlie? Well, I think we've still got an awful lot of companies with big moats. Uh, and a lot of them are very, and some of our industrial brands were just incredibly strong in the niches we're in. Uh, so you, the Berkshire shareholders don't need to worry about it. We're just one big morass of unprofitability or anything like that. But we have not covered ourselves with glory in the new fields. We won't end up all in buggy whips, though, or anything. But, but, uh, uh, but it's a very good question, and it's what we focus on all of the time. And We're hope, trying to improve. And, and we hope you see, we see you back here for your fourth next year. Becky? Uh, this question comes from Stuart Boyd, who's a chemical engineer from Australia. He says, currently Berkshire would be incredibly difficult for an activist investor to target because, number one, Warren, your ownership stake is large. Number two, shareholders appreciate the business is more valuable operating under the Berkshire umbrella rather than being sold off in pieces. And number three, the sheer size or market capitalization of Berkshire is an entry, or entry barrier for most activist investors. Warren and Charlie, after your ownership has been completely distributed, will Berkshire be more vulnerable to activist investors? I'm guessing this isn't something that keeps you up at night, but thought it was worth asking. No, it's going to happen quite a few decades after my death. Yeah. It, I don't think I'll be bothered much by it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything can happen. It's a low probability. It, it can't happen for a lot of years in terms of the way my stock gets distributed and in terms of the way other stock is held. But in the end, Berkshire should prove itself over time. You know, there are no perpetuities. That, and and uh, 
it, it needs to deserve to be con to be continued in its present form. It, it has a lot of attributes that are uh, maximized by being in one entity, which people don't fully understand. They think if you spin off something that would command a high PE, that therefore value has been unlocked, which is to totally nonsense. I mean, it's already built in. Uh, and, it, you know, one, one day out, you know, you might have an extra 3% or 5% in price, but over, over the years, we want to keep the wonderful businesses. But eventually, uh, I think the culture will remain one of a kind. I think that we will be able to do things other people can't do. I think that the advantages of having them in one spot will likely uh, be significant over time. And if that happens, uh, no activist uh, is going to take it over. And if, if the model doesn't work for some reason over a long period of time, then something else should happen. Charlie? Nothing more. Okay. Jay. This question is on Geico. Progressive is gaining the most market share among the major auto insurers based on its presence in the direct and independent agency channels, as well as now bundling its auto and homeowners insurance coverage. How does GEICO plan on responding to competitive threats so that it can retain its place as the second largest auto insurer? I was hoping we could also hear on this topic from Ajit or GEICO's management. Thank you. Okay. The uh, Progressive is a very, very well-run business. GEICO is a very well-run business, and I think they will, for a long time, be the two companies that, that the rest of the auto insurance industry has trouble uh, not losing share to. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, I've always uh, thought for a long, long time, Progressive has been very well run. They, uh, they have an appetite for growth. Uh, sometimes they copy us a little, sometimes we copy them a little. Uh, and I think that'll be true five years from now and 10 years from now. And we sell substantial amounts of, of homeowners insurance. Uh, we have uh, an agency arrangement uh, with that. We were in the business of writing it ourselves until Hurricane Andrew when a decision was made. We didn't control it then, but a decision was made that that the uh, homeowners essentially, uh, you could lose as much in one year as you made in the previous 25 years, and the float isn't as large. So we became a company that that placed our customers' desire for homeowners uh, with several other large and solid organizations. Uh, the big thing is auto insurance. And uh, we grew in the first quarter about 340,000 policies net, which will look quite good uh, compared to anybody but progressive. And uh, 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 that was quite a bit more than last year, but not as not as good as two years ago. And the combined ratio, the, the profit margin was in the nine point uh, area. Uh, so I feel extremely good about Geico. I mean, what what has been built there by Tony and his people is perfect. But I would I would feel fine. Uh, uh, we, we don't own any Progressive, but I think that Progressive is an excellent. Uh, company, and uh, we will watch what they do, and they will watch what we do, and and we will see five years from now or ten years from now uh, which one of us passes State Farm first. <laughs> Charlie? Oh, and, and G, would you like? The underwriting profit is really a function of two major variables. One is the expense ratio, and the other is the loss ratio, without getting too technical. Uh, GEICO has a significant advantage over Progressive, 
when it comes to the expense ratio to the extent of about seven points or so. On the loss ratio side, Progressive does a much better job than Geico does. They have, I think, about a 12-point advantage over Geico. So net-net, Progressive is ahead by about five points. Geico is very aware of this disadvantage on the loss ratio that they are suffering. Uh, and they're very focused in trying to bridge that gap as quickly as they can. They have a few projects in place and, you know, sometimes Geico is ahead of Progressive. Right now, Progressive is ahead of Geico. But I'm hopeful they'll catch up on the loss ratio side and maintain the expense ratio advantage as well. Thank you. Geico has gained market share, essentially. I'd have to look at the figures for sure, but virtually every year since Tony took over, and I would bet significant money that, that GEICO increases its market share in the next five years. And uh, um, it, I think it will for sure this year. And, and so it, 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 it is a terrific business. And uh, uh, Pro Progressive is a terrific business. And uh, we'll, uh, as Ajit says, we've we've got the advantage in expenses and we will have an advantage in expenses. And then the question is, is uh, are we, pro they have a very sophisticated way of pricing business and uh, the question is uh, whether we give some of that five points back or six points back or <laughs> in terms of uh, loss ratio and we're working very hard at that, but I'm sure they're working very hard too to improve their system. So it's a, to some extent, it's a two-horse race, and we've got a very good horse. But Warren, in the nature of things, every once in a while, somebody's a little better at something than we are. Huh. You've noticed. <laughs> yeah, I have noticed. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, yeah, I'd settle for second place in a lot of the business. Okay, Station 11. Mr. Buffett <coughs> and Mr. Munger. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Feroz Kayyum, and I'm from Mississauga in Canada, and now live in New York. My question is how to best emulate your success in building your circle of competence. Given the environment today in investing is a lot more competitive than when you started out, what would you do differently, if anything at all, when building your circle? Would you still build a very broad generalist framework or would you build a much deeper but narrower focus, say, on industries, markets, or even a country? And if so, which ones would interest you? Thank you. Yeah, well, you're right. It is, a, it is much more competitive now than when I started. And you would, uh, when I started, I literally could take the Moody's Industrial Manual, the Moody's Banks of Financial Manual, and I could go through page by page and I, at least run my run my eyes over every company and think about which ones I might think more about. Uh, it's, it's important. I would just do a lot, a whole lot of reading. I'd try and learn as much as I could about as many businesses, and I would try to figure out which ones I really had uh, some important knowledge and understanding that was uh, probably different than overwhelmingly most of my competitors, and I would, I would uh, also try and figure out where, which ones I didn't understand. And I would focus on having as big a circle as I could have and, as, and also focus on being as realistic as I could about where the perimeters of my circle of competence were. I knew when I met Lorimer Davidson in January of 1951, I could get insurance. I mean, it, what he said, made so much sense to me in the three or four hours I spent with him on that Saturday. So I dug into it and I, I, I could understand it. My mind worked well in that respect. Uh, I didn't think I could understand retailing. All I'd done was work for the same grocery store that Charlie had and neither one of us learned that much about retailing except it was harder work than we liked. And uh, you've got to do the same thing and you've got way more competition now. But uh, if you get to know even about a relatively small area more than other people do and you don't feel a compulsion to act too often, you just, you just wait, till, you wait till the odds are strongly in your favor, uh, it's still a very 
interesting game. It's harder than it used to be. Charlie? Well, I think the right strategy for the great mass of humanity is to specialize. Nobody wants to go to a doctor that's half proctologist and half dentist, you know? <laughs> and, and, well, and, the, so the ordinary way to succeed is to narrowly specialize. Warren and I really didn't do that. And that, and we didn't because we, we prefer the other type of activity. But I don't think we can recommend it to other people. Yeah, there's a little more treasure hunting in no, our day. Uh, and, and it was easy to spot the treasure. We made hunting. it work, but it was kind of a lucky thing. Yeah. It's you know, not the standard way to go. The business, at least I best understood, actually was insurance. I mean, I, I and, and I had very little competition. And, you know, I would, if I went to, I went to the insurance department in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I remember one time I drove there just to check on some Pennsylvania company. And this is when you couldn't get all this information on the internet. And I went in and I asked about some company. And the guy said, you're the first one that's ever asked about that company. And uh, uh, there wasn't a lot. I went over to the Standard and Poor's Library on Houston, Houston Street, because they call it. And, and I would go up there and asked for all this obscure information. And there wasn't anybody sitting around there. They had a bunch of tables that you could sit and examine things through. And uh, so it was, it was, there was less competition. But if you know even one thing very well, um, it, 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 it'll give you an edge at some point. That, uh, you know, it's what Tom Watson Sr. said at IBM, you know, uh, I'm no genius but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And that's, that's basically what Charlie and I try to do, and I think that's probably what you can do, but you'll find that those spots. Yeah, we did it in several fields. That's hard. And we got our head handed to us a few times, too. Yeah. Okay, Andrew. Thanks, Warren. Uh, governance question uh, from a shareholder. Larry Fink of BlackRock has predicted that in the near future, all investors will be using ESG, environmental social governance metrics, to help determine the value of a company. I'm worried we don't score well on everything from climate to diversity to inclusion. How well do you think Berkshire measures up on those metrics, and are they valuable metrics? I think in reality we measure up well, but we don't, we don't participate in preparing reports for anybody that asks about it. And we have this, this idea that uh, even though all shareholders are equal, we sort of, we, we prefer individual shareholders. We actually prefer people we know uh, as co-owners. And we don't want to be preparing uh, a lot of reports and asking 60 subsidiaries each to do something with a They'll set up a team and then mail things to headquarters and then we'll supply them to somebody who, if our stock goes up some, is probably going to sell it anyway. We want our managers to do the right things. We give them enormous latitude to do that. And I think that our batting average really is quite good. You saw the, in the movie we talked about having 100% of the electricity. We sell an I, I will come from essentially wind generation. Now that doesn't mean that we get to do it 24 hours a day. We sell some and we buy it. But essentially we will be creating as much wind energy as all of our customers use in electricity. There's one competitive, it's, it's, there's one other utility, electric utility that's about our size and roughly our size in Iowa. And they, they, have, they have practically no wind uh, uh, resources, and uh, the wind blows where they exist too, but we, have, we will have that 100%. As a matter of fact, it's a moving target because we do so well, uh, partly, we do so well on, on, on wind generation that uh, a number of the high-tech companies want to locate in Iowa and get clean energy from us at very low prices, and therefore the moving target becomes our growth in customers in that area. But we're not going to put out a, re we're not, we, we are not going to spend our, the time of the people at Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, responding to questionnaires or trying to score better. 
with somebody that is working on that. Uh, it's just uh, we trust our managers, and I think the performance is, is at least decent, and, uh, uh, and we keep expenses and needless reporting down to a minimum at Berkshire. We do not get, I mentioned this in the annual report, I, don't, I can't imagine another company like it, but here we are, with $500 billion of market capitalization. We do not have a consolidated P&L monthly. We don't need it. You know, now, I can't imagine any other organization doing that, but we don't need it. And uh, we're not going to tie up resources, people resources, doing things we don't need to do just because it's the sort of standard procedure of, in, in corporate America. And corporate America is very worried about, in general, they're very worried about uh, whether somebody's going to upset their apple cart, you know, and with activists and everything. So they want to be very sure that every shareholder is, is happy on issues like that. And, and, and then, fortunately, we don't have to worry about that, so we don't have to run up a lot of expenses uh, doing things that don't actually let us run the business uh, better. Charlie? Well, I think in Berkshire, the environmental stuff is done one level down from us. And I think Greg Abo is just terrific at it. And so I think we score very well. When it gets to so-called best corporate practices, I think the people who talk about them don't really know what the best practices are. They just know what they think are the best practices. And they determine that based on what will sell, not, not what will work. And so I like our way of doing things better than theirs, and I hope to God we never follow their best practices. Yeah. I'd like to point out one thing on independent directors. I mean, I've been on 20 public company corporate boards, not counting any Berkshire or its subsidiaries. So I've, I've seen a lot of corporate boards operate. And uh, the independent directors, in many cases, are, are, the, are the least independent. I mean, if, if the income you receive as a corporate director, which typically may be around 250000 a year now, if that's an important part of your income, and you hope that some other corporation calls the CEO and says, how's so-and-so as a director? And they, the current CEO, the, your CEO says, oh, he's fine. and you know, never raises any problems. Uh, and then you get on another board at 250000 and that's an important part. How in the world is that independent? I mean, it, it's, it, I really, just on observation, I, I, I can't recall particularly any independent director where their income was from the board was important to them. I can't recall them ever doing anything in board meetings or committee meetings that actually was counter to the interests. You know, they put them on the comp committee. I mean, they, they're just not going to upset the apple cart because what they're and I would, I'd probably behave the same way, in the same position. I mean, if, if 250,000 a year is important to you, why in the hell would you behave in a way that's going to cause your CEO to say to the next CEO, say, this guy acts up a little bit too much, you, you know, you really better get somebody else. It's the way it works, but they've got yeah, these I think ideas. it works a little worse than Warren's telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Charlie and it's I... It's really awful. It was awful. I mean, we... And only that Warren and I are... We occupy the niche for pomposity very well ourselves. We don't need any more of it. <laughs> Charlie and I were on one board. Well, I was on one board, actually, a long time ago, where uh, we owned a very significant percentage of the company. And the rest of the board was almost exclusively customers of the company, uh, but not owners. They had absolutely token holdings. And at one point, we were looking at something where a tax decision was being made in terms of a distribution of some securities. And it was a lot of money was involved. And one of the other directors said, well, let's just swallow the tax. Well, his swallowing amounted to about $15 or something. Or something. <laughs> and I said, let's parse this sentence out. Let's swallow the tax. Let's let us swallow the tax. So who wants to swallow an equal amount, to, you know, to me? Uh, 
it's, you know, it's, you don't, you don't get invited to be on boards if you belch too often at the dinner well, table. Well, Blue Chip Stamps, we had a director who said, I don't see why you guys should get be so important just because you own all the shares. Yeah. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie and I used to have to cool off after the Blue Chip Stamps meetings. Yeah. We, we, we and Rick Guerin owned what percent probably? Oh, uh, yeah. 50 percent. Yeah, 50 percent. And they'd appointed all the... the it, it, they were all came, members of the Rotary Club. It came out of a government settlement or something. And... and uh, it was not an ideal form of, of, of uh, decision making. And they just had a different calculus in their mind that we did. And, and I can understand it, but I'm not going to replicate it. <laughs> okay, Greg. Warren and Charlie, U.S. electricity demand has flatlined during the past decade, but could potentially pick up over the next decade with three emerging sources of demand electric vehicle charging, data centers, <coughs> and cannabis <coughs> cultivation expected to account for more than 5% of total U.S. electricity demand. Utilities will have to work hard to benefit from this new demand, though, much of which is likely to accrue to states in the South Atlantic, Central West, and Mountain regions, with the greatest benefit going to firms that invest in grid expansion, smart networks, reliability, and renewable energy. While Berkshire Energy has been aggressive with its capital investments and already has some of the lowest electricity rates in the areas where it competes, it seems like the firm is winding down its annual spending at a time when more might actually be required, with annual spending expected to fall from around $6 billion on average annually to around $4 billion in 2021, with two-thirds of that spending being more maintenance-driven than growth. Is there any one area where you feel Berkshire Energy might need to commit more capital over the next decade to ensure that it captures this future expected demand growth, much as it already has in, with wind power in western Iowa, which is now populated with a lot of data centers, and for territories where demand growth is expected to be the strongest, but where Berkshire does not have a presence, are there any avenues aside from acquisitions for the company to put capital to work? Well, I'm going to throw that over to it, Gene, in just a second. But I will tell you that <clears throat> we have <clears throat> th three owners of Berkshire Hathaway Energy. <clears throat> we are the 91 percent owner. And there are no three owners that are more interested in pouring money into sensible deals within the utility industry or are better situated in terms of the people we have to maximize any opportunities. We have never had a penny of dividends in, in whatever it is, close to 20 years of owning Mid-American Energy. And other utility companies pay high dividends. They, uh, they just don't have the capital appetite, essentially, that, that we do. So it's just a question of finding sensible projects. And, and I would say that, that there's, no, there's no group that, that is uh, as, as smart about it, as motivated about it as our group. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Greg. In short, we're about as good as you can get. And you should worry about something else. Yeah. But Greg, if you could you stand up and talk about We really hope to spend a lot of money in energy. Yeah, yeah, afternoon. Yeah, Greg, you touched on it. A couple critical areas we go forward is to look realistically in the 21, 2022 20, time frame, because as you've touched on, we've got a great portfolio as we finish out 19, 2019, 2020, and it's really been focused on building the renewable energy projects in Iowa, expanding the grid. But equally, we do have those opportunities in our other utilities. The footprint in Iowa realistically is getting pretty full as we had 100% renewables. Um, Warren touched on it. Every time we get a new data center, that means we can build another 300 megawatts of renewables. We'll continue to do that. <clears throat> but when you look at Pacific Corp, where we serve six states in the, in the Northwest, we've really just embarked on an expansion program there. The first part was to build significant transmission to so expand the grid and then start to build renewables. But just to give you some perspective of the regulation that exists in place, we started that project in 2008. And we're realistically building the first third of it. But we do have the planning in place for the second phase and the third phase. And that's what you'll see come into place in 2021 and 23. And the reality is we'll continue to do that in NV Energy with it really, again, the focus being on both grid expansion so we can move the resources and then supplementing it with renewables. So it's exactly what you've touched on. And 
we haven't identified the specific projects yet, so we never put them in our capital forecast that we disclosed to, to folks. But as they firm up and we know they're, they will go forward, uh, clearly you'll see some incremental, incremental capital. And that's capital we clearly earn on behalf of the Berkshire shareholders as we, as we, uh, as we deploy it. Thank good, you. Good. We will put a lot of money into energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're really in marvelous shape in this department. Incidentally, and, and you know, Walter Scott, I mean, he, he gets excited looking at all these projects, uh, and goes out and visit them. He, he has, he knows way more about the business than, than, than he's forgotten more about it than I'll ever know. But we, we've got a great partnership. We've got unlimited capital. We've got, uh, we'll continue to have it. And there's needs for huge capital in the industry. So I, I think 10 years from now or 20 years from now, uh, we will be, our record will be looked at and there'll be nothing like it in, in the energy business. Uh, well, Greg, well, is there anybody ahead of where we are in Iowa in terms of oh. energy? <laughs> uh, there, uh, Charlie, there, there's realistically no one ahead of us in the U.S., let alone Iowa. When you look at our the amount of energy we produce relative to what our what our customers consume, uh, we really lead, do lead the nation in and, Iowa. And, and our rates about half that of our main competitor in Iowa to boot. Close. Exactly, close. we're right in that range. If this isn't good enough for you, why like, we can't help you? <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I mean we we sell we sell electricity five miles from here. But, Greg, is that correct? That, yeah, I mean, right across the river. Yeah, yeah, right across the river. And, you know, the wind blows the same and all of that sort of thing. And the public power district here, we, all, in Nebraska, going back to George Norris, has always been a, a, a public power state. That There's, there's no, uh, capitalism doesn't exist in the, in the electric utility field in Nebraska. So, so they have had the advantage of selling tax-exempt bonds. We have to sell taxable bonds, which raises costs to some degree. They have a big surplus, which they don't have to pay any dividends on or anything else, and our rates are cheaper than theirs, you know, basically. I mean, we, yeah. we're very proud of our utility operation. Carol? Warren, you are a big advocate of index investing of, and of not trying to time the market. But by your having Berkshire hold such a large amount of cash and T-bills, it seems to me you don't practice what you preach. I'm thinking that a good alternative would be for you to invest most of Berkshire's excess cash in a well-diversified index fund until you find an attractive acquisition or buyback stock. Had you done that over the past 15 years, all the time keeping the $20 billion cash cushion you want, I estimate that at the end of 2018, the company's $112 billion balance in cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments in T-bills would have instead been worth about $155 billion. The difference between the two figures is an opportunity cost equal to more than 12% of Berkshire's current book value. What is your response to what I say? And for I forgot to say, the question is from Mike Elzhar, who is with the Colony Group located in Boca Raton, Florida. That's a perfectly response? decent question, and I, I wouldn't quarrel with the numbers. And I would say that that, that, that is an alternative, for example, that my successor uh, may wish to employ, because on balance, I would rather own uh, an index fund than, than, than carry treasury bills. I would, I would say that if we'd instituted that policy in 2007 or 8, uh, we might have been in a different position in terms of, of our ability to move uh, late in 2008 or 2009. Uh, so it, it, has certain, it has certain execution problems with hundreds of billions of dollars than it does if you were having a similar policy with a billion or two billion or something of the sort. But it's a perfectly, it's a perfectly rational observation and certainly looking back on 10 years, uh, of a bull market, it, it, it really jumps out at you. But I would argue that, that, uh, that uh, uh, if, 
if you were working with smaller numbers, it, it would make a lot of sense. And if they're working with large numbers, it's, it, it might well make sense in the future at Berkshire to operate that way. You know, we committed 10 billion a week ago, and there are conditions under which, and they're not, they're not remote, they're not likely in any given week or month or year, but, but there are conditions under which we could spend $100 billion very, very quickly. Uh, uh, and if we did, if those conditions existed, it would be the capital very well deployed and much better than in an index fund. And so we've been, uh, we're operating on the basis that we will get chances to deploy capital. They will come in clumps in all likelihood. And uh, they will come when other people don't want to allocate capital. Charlie, what do you think about it? Well, I plead guilty to being a little more conservative with the cash than other people. And, but I think that's all right. Uh, we could have put all the money into a lot of securities that would have done better than the S&P with 2020 hindsight. Remember, we had all that extra cash all that period if something had come along in the way of opportunities and so on. I don't think it's a sin to be a little strong on cash when you're as big a company as we are. Uh, we don't have to. I watched Harvard use the last ounce of their cash, including all their prepaid tuition from the parents, and plunge it into the market at exactly the wrong moment and make a lot of forward commitments to private equity. And they suffered like two or three years of absolute agony. We plus, don't want to be like Harvard. Plus timber and a whole bunch of things. Well, I mean, plus timber and, I mean... It, yeah, it, yeah, we're not going to change. No. <laughs> we, we, we do like having a lot of money to be able to operate very fast and very big. And we don't... And maybe we won't... We know we won't get those opportunities frequently. I don't think... Uh, it, certainly, you know, in the next... You know, in the next... 20 or 30 years, there'll be a two or three times when it'll be raining gold and all you have to do is go outside. But uh, uh, we don't know when they will happen, and, and we have a lot of money to commit. And I would say that if you told me I had to either carry short-term treasury bills or have index funds and just let that money be invested in America generally, I would take the index funds. But we still have hopes. And the one thing you should very definitely understand about Berkshire is that we run the business in a way that we think is consistent with serving shareholders who have virtually all of their net worth in Berkshire. I happen to be in that position myself, but I would do it that way under any circumstances. We have a lot of people who trust us, who, who uh, really have disproportionate amounts of Berkshire compared to their net worth, uh, if you were to follow standard investment procedures, and and uh, uh, we want to make money for everybody, but we want to make very very sure that we don't lose permanently money from anybody for anybody that buys our stock somewhere around intrinsic business value to begin with. We we just have an we have an aversion to having a million plus shareholders, maybe as many as two million and having a lot of them uh, ever really lose money if they're willing to stay with us for a while. And we know how people behave if, when, when the world generally is, is uh, upset. And uh, they want to be with something. I think they want to be with something that they feel is like the Rock of Gibraltar. And, and uh, we, have a, we, have a disp we have a real disposition toward that group. Jonathan? Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have new financing programs for manufactured home loans that I'm guessing could finally put purchasers of those homes who need mortgages on a somewhat more level playing field with those buying site-built homes. How positive an effect do you expect these new programs to have on manufactured home demand? And how might the programs affect Clayton's sizable profits from lending? Will, will Clayton sell more loans to Freddie and Fannie? And does that help profit even profits even if spreads compress? Well, it may not help profits, but it, would, it, it definitely is good if the Freddie and Fannie uh, uh, 
are authorized to do more lending against manufactured homes. I mean, manufactured homes are a very reasonable way for to get people to get decent housing and have a home, uh, and they are hard to finance to some degree. Uh, the local banks frequently do it, but the big lenders haven't wanted to do it. They are, there is the possibility or the likelihood that Freddie and Fannie are going to expand. We already, we already sell, I don't know whether it's 10 million a month of loans or something like that to Freddie and Fannie, but it would be very good for America, in my view, if Freddie and Fannie did more in that area. Uh, obviously, we would sell some more homes, but we would lose financing, and we might come out behind, we might come out ahead, uh, but I think, it's, I think it would be a good thing to do. Charlie? Well, I think Freddie and Fannie will finance more and more homes, and I think they'll do more and more of it through Clayton. And they'll do it because Clayton is very trustworthy and will do a very good job at, at making good housing at cheap prices for people. And uh, I think Clayton will get bigger and bigger and bigger as far ahead as you can see. And the guy is young, he doesn't look like Warren and me. Not at all. We've got a terrific managerial group at, yeah. at Clayton, and, and we're expanding our site build homes. We just closed on uh, a builder a couple, a few days ago, and we now have nine different, I believe, nine different site built home operations, and we didn't have any a few years ago. And uh, uh, we think extraordinarily well of Kevin Clayton and his group, our directors, met last year in Knoxville uh, and viewed the, the Clayton operation for the second time. And uh, so we like the idea of uh, Clayton expanding, and, and we like the idea of more people having very affordable housing. During, during the 2008 and 2009 recession, our borrowers who had very low FICO scores on average, I mean, compared to typical home buyers. And they, if they kept their jobs, they, and they made the payments. I mean, they, they wanted that home, and the home was an enormously important item to them. And we had various programs that helped them as well. But our loan experience was far better than uh, people anticipated under the stress that existed then. But it was because a home really means something uh, uh, to people, and uh, uh, absent, absent losing jobs or sickness, and like I say, we have some programs to help people. They, they, make, they make the payments, and uh, uh, they have very decent living, but they would get that even cheaper uh, if Freddie and Fannie expanded uh, their programs, and I, like I say, I hope they do. Okay, station two. Charlie. My name is Carrie, and this is my daughter, Chloe. She's 11 weeks. It's her very first Berkshire meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We're from San Francisco, and we have a question on employment for you. As both a major employer and a producer of consumer goods, what do you make of the uncertain outlook for good full-time jobs with the rise of automation and temporary employment? Well, if we'd asked that question 200 years ago uh, and somebody said, with the outlook for development of farm machinery and tractors and combines and so on, meaning that 90% of the people on farms were going to be, lose their job, uh, it would look terrible, wouldn't it? But our economy, and our people, our system, has been remarkably ingenious in achieving whatever we have now, 160 million jobs, when throughout the period ever since 1776, we've been figuring out ways to 
get rid of jobs. That's what capitalism does, and it produces more and more goods per person. And we never know exactly where they're going to come from. I mean, it, it uh, you know, I don't know what you were, you were, uh, whatever uh, occupation. Well, if you were in the passenger train business, I mean, you know, you were going to, that was going to change. But we find ways in this economy to employ more and more people, and we've got now more people employed than ever in the history of the country, even though company after country and company, and particularly in heavy industry and that sort of thing, has been trying to figure out naturally how to get more productive all the time, which means turning out the same number of goods with fewer people or, or turning out more goods with the same number. That's, that is capitalism. I don't, think, I don't think you need to worry about American ingenuity uh, running out. I mean, I mean you, uh, you look at people in all kinds of, I mean, of businesses, and they like to make money, but they really like to, they like to be inventive. You know, they like they, they like to do things. And uh, and this economy, uh, it works. It'll continue to work, and it'll be very it's very tough uh, in certain industries, and. There will be dislocations. You know, we won't be making as many horseshoes and that sort of thing when cars come along and all of that. But we do find ways now to employ whatever we're employing, 155, whatever it is, million people, and supporting a population of 330 million people. When we started with 4 million people, with 80% of the labor, being employed on farms. So this system works and it will continue to work. And I, I don't know what the next big thing will be. <clears throat> I do know there will be a next big thing. Charlie? Well, we want to shift the scud work to the robots to the extent we can. That's what we've been doing, as Warren said, for 200 years. Nobody wants to go back to being a blacksmith or scooping along the street, picking up the horseman or whatever to help each people used to do. Uh, we're glad to have that work eliminated. And a lot of this worry about the future comes from leftists who worry terribly that, that uh, the people at the bottom of the economic pyramid have had a little stretch when the people at the top got ahead faster. That happened by accident because we were in so much trouble that we had to flood the world with money and drive interest rates down to zero. And of course, that drove asset prices up and helped the rich. Nobody did that because they suddenly loved the rich. It was just an accident, and it, it, it will soon pass. Uh, I, we we want to have all this productivity improvement, and we shouldn't worry a little about the fact that one class or another is a little ahead at one stretch. Charlie, Charlie and I, we worked in a grocery store, and when people ordered a can of beans, we had ladders that we climbed up to reach the can of peas, and then we placed it in a folding box, and then we put it on the truck. And if you looked at the amount of food actually transferred between the producer and the person who consumed it, and the, per and the number of people involved in the transaction, you know, it was, I don't know whether it was one third or one quarter or one fifth as efficient as the way, the best way now to get food delivered to you. And, and the food know, was worse. <laughs> and and my grandfather would you know was distressed about the fact that 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 this particular credit and delivery kind of store would would be eliminated and it was eliminated but society it's coming because, back it, it's, it's coming back it's coming back but more efficiently yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyway we we've, we've seen a little creative destruction and and frankly we're glad that it freed us up to go into the investment business it worked out better for us becky uh, this question comes from Brian Gust of Grafton, Wisconsin. Uh, he's talking about regulators and politicians and says, the Berkshire Hathaway investment portfolio holds several large financial institutions that are heavily regulated and are politically charged. Do you feel that in some cases the regulators and or politicians are running the big banks instead of the CEO and the board of directors? Sure. 
<laughs> but not too much. No, and insurance has been regulated. It happens to be regulated primarily on a state basis, but insurance has been regulated ever since we went into it. And it, it hasn't, you know, when I, when I looked at Geico, it was doing seven million of business, and, you know, it, 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 it will do 30 odd billion of, billion of business now. It, it's been regulated the whole time. And regulation can be a pain in the neck generally, but on the other hand, we don't want a bunch of charlatans operating in the insurance business. And, and insurance actually lends itself to charlatans because you get handed money and you give the other guy a promise. And, and uh, I like the fact that there is regulation in the insurance business or the banking business. It doesn't mean it can't drive you crazy sometimes or anything of the sort, but those businesses should be regulated. It, uh, they're they're uh, too important, and any time you can, you can take other people's money and they go home with a promise and you go home with the money, I, I, I don't mind a certain amount of regulation in those businesses. Charlie? Yeah, well, if you're using the government's credit because you have deposit insurance, there's an implicit bargain. You can't be too crazy with what you do with the money. That's a perfectly reasonable. And I, I absolutely believe that we should have a regulation system that, that uh, involves supervision of risk taking by banks. It got particularly bad in the investment banks at the peak of the, the, the uh, real estate crisis. And the behavior was, there's only one word for the behavior. It was disgusting. And it was pretty much everybody. It's hard to think of anybody who stayed sane in that boom. They, they felt the other guys doing dumb things, I've got to do it too, or I'll be left out. What a crazy way to behave. And so, sure, there's some intervention, but it probably has to be. You want a Food and Drug Administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll be unhappy with how they do it if you're in the business and all of that, but, and, you know, I, I find any kind of regulation irritating, but nevertheless, it, it's good for the system. And, and actually, a number of regulators, I would, you know, I, I would say that they've really been quite sensible about regulation. But, uh, uh, you don't feel that way when you're, being told how to run your business, but it, as Charlie says, you, you wouldn't want to be a bank that, that ran in an unregulated system where anybody could come in and do all kinds of things that would actually have, that would have consequences that drew you into their, the problems that they created themselves. And, uh, uh, we had the Wild West in banking and long ago, and, and uh, uh, it, it produced a lot of problems in the, in the 19th century. Jay? For the past several years, in Berkshire's annual shareholder letter, there's been increasingly less detail provided on its operating businesses and financial performance. For example, the company is no longer providing details on the finance and financial products segment, or a balance sheet for the manufacturing, service, and retail segment, or a breakdown of float by unit in the insurance business. For a company as large and diversified as Berkshire, why are investors being provided less information than previously? Well, I don't think we actually provide less information. Uh, we may present it in a somewhat different form from year to year. Just uh, This year, for example, I, you know, I, I started my letter, as usual in my mind, as saying, Dear Doris and Bertie, my sisters, to tell them what I would tell anybody that had a very significant proportion of their net worth in Berkshire, who was intelligent, did not know all the lingo of our various businesses, that would read a lot of words because they, had, they did have a large investment. So if I explained anything and did a decent job, that they would understand what I was talking about. And uh, uh, I tell them that in the language that I think will be understandable to the 
to a significant percentage of a million plus people who have all kinds of different understanding of accounting and all that sort of thing. I, I tell them the information I would want to hear on the other side. Now, if I was a competitor and I wanted to know what one of our furniture store was, was earning or something of the sort, you know, I might love it, but it doesn't really make any difference. If you're talking about a $500 billion organization, if you understand our insurance business and in terms of giving you the picture, I think in three or four or five pages, you know, actually we've got a whole bunch of stuff that required by the SEC about loss reserve development. I, I think you can write a 300 page report that gives a whole lot less information than a 50 page report and you lose people. Uh, uh, so I, I try to tell them, tell them, like I say, in my mind, it's my sisters. Uh, I try to tell them uh, what I would tell them if we had a private business and they, they owned a third of it each and I owned a third and once a year they like to get filled in and, and they, don't know, they don't know what a combined ratio means because it's a dumb term that everybody uses and it's important they can call it a profit margin. Uh, they don't know what an, the operating ratio is in, 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 in the uh, railroad business and it's an obsolete term. It'd be better to call that a profit margin, but the lingo, we're not writing it for analysts. We are writing it for for shareholders, and we're trying to tell them something so they can make an addition. They can not only get the picture as to what we own now, but how we think about the operation, what we're trying to do over time, and uh, uh, we try to do the best job we can every year. And I don't think it. I think if somebody is terribly interested in the details, they really are missing the whole picture because. You could have known every detail of our textile business in, in 1965, but we could give you the information as how much we made from linings and how much we made from, from handkerchiefs, and uh, it would, you'd be in a different world. I mean, it, the important thing was how we looked at running money and what, what we would do about things over time, and, and uh, uh, it just, you could have gotten very misled. If, if you'd written it in 1980 or 85 and you looked for great detail on how C's Candy was doing and as they moved eastward, you know, we'll tell you that, that, that overall that fell in terms of moving out the territory, but going into a whole lot of detail that might be very interesting to an analyst, but really for a shareholder, they've got to make a decision as to who's running their money and how they're running it and what they've done over time and what they hope to do in the future and how to measure that. And uh, we're, again, we're writing it for the individual. Charlie? Well, uh, I suppose I should be watching every tiny little business down to the last nickel, but I don't. And I don't want that much detail. And I think our competitors would like it and it wouldn't do our shareholders any good. So we'll probably just keep reporting the way we do. You can see how flexible we are here. <laughs> it's around. Station three. Ms. Barfitch and Ms. Mungo. I'm Xia Xue Jingjing from China International Capital Corporation Limited. Last week, China announced 12 new measures on further opening up the financial industry. All these measures will allow me more invested institutions to enter into Chinese financial market and to ensure the policies of foreign investment to be consistent with those of domestic investment. What do you think about these new measures? Do you believe the foreign financial institutions will have more pricing power over the Chinese stock markets in the future? Do you have any plans to set up a company in China? If so, what time? Thank you. Well, we've got one now. Dairy Queen is all over China. And it's working fine. And we didn't wait for new laws. We did it under the old laws. But we're not that big net in China, right, Warren? We're not that big what? In China. No, uh, but we, we had something, you know, that could have happened that 
would, would have been quite sizable. But China, it's, it's a big market, and we like big markets. I mean, we really can only deploy capital on a major, in a major way, maybe in 15 or so countries, or just because of the size. Of but generally, I think the climate is getting better. It yeah. really makes sense for the two countries to get along. Think of how stupid it would be if China and the United States didn't get along. Stupid on both sides, I might add. Yeah, we've, we've done well in China. We haven't done enough, but. <laughs> Andrew? Warren, this is a question from a member of the House of Lords in Westminster who happens mm. to be here today, who also is a shareholder of the company. This is Lord Gaudia, who says you've written, we hope to invest significant sums across borders. So what's your appetite to invest in the UK and Europe, and how will Brexit impact that? And while we're at it, what's your advice for solving UK's Brexit dilemma? <laughs> That's yours, Warren. <laughs> Well, I, can t I, I will tell you this. I mean, I, I, I gave an interview to the Financial Times that I don't do that very often. But one of the considerations I have is that I would like to see Berkshire Hathaway better known in, in both the UK and, and Europe. And, and uh, the FT audience was an audience that, that uh, I hoped would think of Berkshire more often in terms of when businesses are for sale. Our name is familiar, I think, pretty much around the world in at least financial circles, but there's no question if anybody's going to sell a large business in the United States, uh, they're going to think of Berkshire. They may decide for other reasons they'd rather do it differently, and, uh, but they will think of Berkshire. And uh, I don't think, I, I mean, obviously that is not as true around the world. We've had some very good luck with with a few people that have thought of Berkshire. I mean, such as at Iskar and, and, and actually uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy had actually, one of its base holdings from way back uh, was in the UK. But I was looking, in doing that interview, uh, I, was, I was willing to spend three hours with the FT reporters uh, in the hope that, that when, they write about, when they write the story that somebody someplace thinks of Berkshire that wouldn't otherwise think of it. And uh, we'd love to put more money uh, into the UK. I mean, if I get a call tomorrow and somebody uh, says, you know, I've got the next billion dollar pound company that I think might make sense for you to own and that I would like to actually have as part of Berkshire, you know, I'll, I'll get on the plane and, and uh, be over there, but they'll have to name. They'll have to tell me what their price ideas are and what it's earning. So I'm not. I'm not. I'm not interested in in going over and talking about it and pricing it for them, and then not making a deal. We we like to make deals when we when we actually get into action. Uh, we're hoping for it, uh, and we're hoping for a deal in the UK and in Europe, and or in Europe. Uh, uh, no matter how Brexit comes out, I think it. I I don't. I'm not an Englishman, but I have the feeling it was a mistake to vote to leave. But I don't think it's, I don't think it, it doesn't, it doesn't destroy my appetite in the least for making a very large acquisition in the UK. Charlie? Well, all my ancestors came from Northern Europe, so I'm very partial to the place. On the other hand, if you ask me how to, I would vote on Brexit if I lived in Britain, I don't even know. It just strikes me as a horrible problem. And I'm glad it's theirs, not mine. But if I called you tomorrow and said we had a deal in UK, you'd, you'd tell me oh, to I, I, I would go in in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Those, or are you'd tell kind, me those are my kind of people. I understand them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Warren, just want to kind of maybe follow up on those past two questions because there is sort of a theme there. It, it seems to me that there's definitely more of a home country bias when we look at the acquisitions and investments that Berkshire has done historically. And while there's definitely value in sticking with what you know and, and feel the most comfortable with, 
it seems like you've gone from a model that was originally focused on putting boots on the ground to find investment and acquisition opportunities to one where you, you're seemingly more content to have sellers or the representatives call you or drop by the office, basically more of a pool model than a push model. There's nothing wrong with this, but I just wonder if the opportunity cost that comes with this type of model is that Berkshire misses out on a lot of overseas business where owners are unaware of your willingness to step up and buy them outright and allow them to run their companies under the Berkshire umbrella and missing stocks investment opportunities because Berkshire is not necessarily familiar enough with the local market. At this point, do you think Berkshire would benefit from putting more boots on the ground in these overseas markets? We actually must have been, after we bought his car, Adon Wertheimer um, convinced me that that we should get more exposure in Europe. And he, and, he, and, he, and he helped out in doing that. I went over, he arranged uh, various meetings. Uh, we've had a lot of contact. It isn't that they're not, a, they're not aware. Uh, and we do hear about some, but we do have the problem, they've got to be sizable. I mean, if we do a, a billion dollar acquisition and it makes $100 million or thereabouts pre-tax, $80 million after tax, you know, it, it's, if we really know the business and we're sure we're not going to have a problem with the people running it being, being motivated in the future and doing a similar job as to when they had their own money and everything, it's nice to, to add $80 million to $25 billion, but it, you can't afford to spend lots of time doing that. And we've, we've, we gain something by having Todd and Ted uh, do some looking at things, screening them and all that sort of thing. But uh, in the end, you want somebody that, some family that's held, that held their business in Europe or in the UK for 50 or 100 years that can make a deal and that and that wants to do it uh, with Berkshire. I mean, if they're, if they're looking for to get the most money, if they want to have an auction, we're not going to win and we're not going to participate because we're not going to waste our time on it. Uh, it it's, uh, if we form a acquisition crew, they'll acquire something. I mean, I, I've, I've watched so many institutions in operation that, uh, uh, you know, if, you're, if your job every day is to go to work and screen a bunch of things with the idea that you're the strategic department or acquisition department. You're going to want to do something. I'm, I want to do something, but I don't want to do something unless Berkshire benefits by it and clearly benefits by it, and it's generally it's to the size. Well, Warren, our problem is not, not a lack of boots on the ground. Our problem is the people on the ground are paying prices that we don't want to pay. Yeah. That's our problem. We can, we can, and that problem is not going to be cured by boots. We can spend $100 billion in the next year. That is not a problem. No. Spending it intelligently is a huge problem. And, and uh, the our, our competitors are buying with somebody else's money, yeah. and they get part of the upside and take none of the downside. And they'll leverage that is it hard up. to compete with people like that. Yeah. They'll leverage it up. They'll make a lot of money if it fails, and they'll make even more money if it succeeds. And... Uh, that's not our. That's not our equation. No. Uh, and that has. That isn't always that way. But it's. It's certainly that way now. It's probably. Uh, it's not in the shareholders' interest that we get to be like everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Station four. Mr. Buffett. And Mr. Munger, thank you so much for the wisdom you've shared with us over the years. This is Stephen Wood from New York. And um, Mr. Buffett, thank you very much for your feedback, your very generous feedback last August on the book that I'm writing. I just had one follow-up, if I may. In studying the most significant value creators of all time, it is very evident that the major compounding effect happened later at the later stages of the careers, or in Vanderbilt's case, even beyond his own career. So your recent investments have suggested to me that you are designing Berkshire to being a steady compounding machine that should continue to create value for a very long time. Would you both please elaborate on this compounding machine and the machine's ability to continue to adapt 
to keep this value creation durable? Uh, and then is this legacy one of your sort of primary motivations when you wake up every day? I would say it's the, it is the primary motivation, but it's been that for a very, very, very long time. No matter what was going right in my life, the things that were going badly, I'm sure I, I would not feel good. You know, I don't need to be spending my time working on something that, that makes me feel bad about the results. You know, when we get through, so I, and it's 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 something that's doable. I mean, the culture is stronger now than it was 10 years ago, and it was stronger then than 10 years previously. It moves slowly, but it goes in the right direction. And when we get chances to deploy the capital, we. We've always tried to make any entity, whether it was the partnership originally or the or Berkshire <coughs> now or Blue Chip Snaps when we owned it or, or even Diversified Redeem, we, we wanted them all to be compounding, in effect, be compounding machines. That's why people gave us capital. That's why we put our own capital in. And if we failed at it, we, feel like we really felt like we'd failed. It didn't make any difference how much money we made from fees or anything like that. We, we, we knew what our yardstick was. And, and so that... That will continue. I think Berkshire is better situated than it's ever been, except for the fact that size is a drag on performance. And I, I probably wrote that 40 years ago. I wrote it actually when I closed the partnership to new money when we had like $40 million in it. I just said that, uh, that really the new, that additional capital would drag down returns from a $40 million base. So you can imagine how I feel with it. $368 billion base of capital in Berkshire now. But this culture is special. It can work. It won't be the highest compounder by a long shot against many other businesses. I think it won't be, it'll be one of the safest ways to make decent money over time. But uh, that will depend on the people that follow us. Charlie? Well, we came a long way from very small beginnings. And the fact that it slows down a little when it becomes monstrous is not my idea of a huge tragedy. I, and I think we will continue to do very well in the future. We had nothing like the energy operation you know, 20 years ago. And it's a powerhouse. We had nothing like Kevin's operation in home building 30 years ago, and it will soon be the biggest. Well, even now it's bigger than anybody else in the country if you count both types of high housing, isn't it? Houses? I think so. And we have a lot going for us, and I'm satisfied. I think it's going to continue reasonably. And it would ruin our life if we did it terribly. <laughs> So that, that's what we wake up thinking about in the morning. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in a business where I was going to let down other people. And I think you'd be crazy to do something like that, even if you weren't rich in 88. <laughs> so uh, it, but we are motivated to have something that, that is regarded as, as something different than others. And, and, and we're actually in a world where so much money is institutionalized you know, uh, I, I like the idea of having somebody that's actually owned by individuals in, in very significant part who basically trust us and, and uh, you know, don't worry about what the next quarter's earnings are going to be. I, I, think it, I think it's different than much of capitalism, and I think it's a, something that Charlie and I feel good about. Additional Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Carol? Uh, this question comes from Stefan Jabode of Danville, California, and it raises a question I've certainly never heard before. Mr. Buffett, in the past you have recommended low-cost S&P, and again today, the S&P 500 index funds as reliable long-term investment vehicles. These funds have certain inherent structural advantages, such as low costs, and automatically, automatic reshuffling of their holding. But Berkshire also has certain structural advantages, such as financial leverage from the float and diverse capital allocation opportunities. I think of Berkshire as being ahead in this game, 
For example, it seems to me that if Berkshire's overall operating business and investment performance were to exactly match the total return of the S&P index over a 10-year period, Berkshire's growth in intrinsic value would outperform the S&P 500. If you agree, could you estimate by how many percentage points? <laughs> well, the answer is I won't estimate anything, but uh, the, if, if we just own stocks and we own the S&P, our performance would be significantly worse than the S&P because we would be incurring a corporate tax, which would now be 21% on capital gains, plus possibly some state income taxes, and effectively our tax rate on dividends is, is depends where they're held, but, uh, somewhere between 10 and a half and, or 11 and 13%. So Berkshire is a, is a mistake uh, it's a it's at a corporate disadvantage simply by the way the tax law runs compared to owning an index fund which has no tax at the corporate level but but uh, just passes through uh, to shareholders so I I wouldn't I don't uh, I don't know whether we'll we'll outperform the S&P 500 or not I know that we'll behave with our shareholders money exactly as we would behave with our own money and we will have will basically tie our, our fortunes in life to, to this business, and we will be very cognizant of doing anything that can destroy value in any significant way. But we will probably, uh, if, if there were to be a, a very strong bull market from this point forward, or we would probably underperform during that period. If uh, the market five years from now or 10 years from now is is at this level or below, we will probably overperform. But, but uh, uh, I'm not. I'm, I don't think that I want. I, I, I don't quite understand the question in terms of uh, when it says the total return of the S and P over a 10-year period and Berkshire's growth in intrinsic value would outperform. I, I, I don't know whether that will happen or not, Charlie. Well, it'd be one big advantage for the shareholders that pay taxes. And that is that uh, the, the Berkshire shareholders, even if we just match the s and we, we'd be way ahead after taxes. We all have a pretty decent role in life and a pretty good position. We shouldn't be too disappointed. No. If we, had, we could have structured, going back to partnership days, we could have structured things so that actually, over a period of time, doing the same things we did, uh, would have act, would, would have come out somewhat more favorably for shareholders if we kept it to the original partnership group. But but the the present form hasn't worked badly. Although we have in, had periods when our corporate capital gains tax, as opposed to the individual, uh, I think it got up to thirty nine percent a couple of years or one year and. Certainly, was 35 percent for a long time, and then on top of that, we had we had uh, state income taxes in some cases, and they exceeded. Uh, well, I mean, if you owned a pass-through fund, you, you you did not have that level of possible double taxation. Now, if you hold your stock forever, you don't pay it. But if you actually sell your stock, you've had a double tax effect. We're not complaining in any way, shape, or form. This country has treated us incredibly well. And we've had this huge tailwind, which I wrote about in the annual report, and it wouldn't have happened in any other country. So uh, it's, uh, we, we've been very lucky that, that we've been operating in this country at this time. Charlie? No. Jonathan? Uh, in Nevada, several casinos have cut the cord with our NV Energy subsidiary and are seeking their electricity needs elsewhere even though they had to pay huge exit fees. I have three questions about this phenomenon. One, do you believe that these are rational choices or were they made for non-economic reasons? Two, what can NVD do, if anything, to stem the tide of defections? 
And three, is this something that could happen in other states where you operate regulated utilities, or is the situation in Nevada uh, somehow unique because of supersized customers that have more leverage in the power market than smaller industrial customers in other states? And I don't know whether you, uh, that's a question for you or Greg, but I'd be happy to hear from either of you. It's a question for Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, John. Then, so uh, just for everybody, I think they heard the question from Jonathan. But uh, we've owned the utility there for approximately five years. Um, when we inherited the utility, we knew it had some fundamental issues around its customers. The relationships were really strained from day one because they'd had a history of continuing to increase rates, and they really weren't uh, delivering renewable energy or, or, or meeting the customer's needs or expectations. So we, we knew we had some challenges there. As we sit here today, uh, we've had five customers leave our system. Those customers still use our distribution services. So the only thing we do not provide them is the power. So we have lost an opportunity to sell them power, and we've lost the associated margin on that. Um, and we're disappointed with that. Uh, we do recover you know, substantial fees, as you, as you noted. How the commission looked at it was, well, you'll lose this customer. We'll give you effectively six years of profit on that. And by then, you should have grown back into um, your normal load. And actually, it's a fair outcome. Our load is higher than it was relative to when those customers have left. So we've grown through that, and it's consistent with their, their belief. The fundamental issue, and you've touched on it, why are they leaving? Um, there are economic reasons for them leaving. And the fundamental reason is in year seven, they no longer bear sort of the societal costs that are being imposed by the state. They don't have to bear the cost of renewable energy. They don't bear the cost of energy efficiency. And they viewed it as sort of the time to exit out of that model. Uh, we do have a variety of legislation that's going to levelize the playing field. We've had a number of customers that announced they were leaving now have entered into long-term agreements with NV Energy. And I really do believe our team has the right model, which we're much more focused on delivering a great value proposition to our customers. So it has to include price. But equally, we're building substantial renewable energy there now. And uh, long term, our team will, will, will deliver a great proposition to them. And I think that um, and Envy Energy, will, it, it will prosper in the long term. We're going to be happy with it as a, as a long term investment. Thank you. Greg, could you? Uh, could you uh, give them, give the audience a uh, rough approximation of what, say, in the 10 years or whatever it may be before we bought Nevada Power, what had happened with rates, what has happened with rates under us, and what has happened with coal generation uh, under us? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So it's, uh, you know, Warren's really expanding on what we are, the focus we brought to delivering something to the customer. So if you'd looked at the prior 10 years, they pretty much had a rate strategy that every second year their rates would go up sort of by the cost of inflation. And that pretty much materialized uh, year after year. We came in immediately just like we've done in Iowa. So we've built all that renewable in Iowa and we've never increased rates since the date we acquired it, 1999. So rates have been stable, and we don't ever see raising rates in Iowa till probably 2030 or 2031. Uh, our team took a very similar approach in, in Nevada, which was to you know, stabilize it. Uh, so rates are, are down probably 5 to 7% since we've owned them. So we haven't had rate increases. We've announced substantial rate increases again that will take effect every two years. So just like we used to be able to have rate increases, we have a, a view of when we'll decrease their rates. The rates will go down again in, uh, in 2002. We've, uh, and, and, or I mean, uh, in two years. Uh, and then on top of that, there's been an approach to uh, eliminate coal, as, as Warren touched on. So fundamentally, when we acquired it, all their coal fleet was operating. We've retired a substantial portion of the coal fleet already. And by, I, I believe it's within a year of this, 2023, we'll have eliminated 100% of their 
use of coal in that state, and it was a substantial portion of their portfolio in the past. So, team's done a great job. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, have a no. uh, station five. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Aaron Lanny. Uh, I'm a portfolio manager at a company called Medici out of Montreal, Quebec. My uh, question is actually for uh, Todd and Ted, if possible. Um, so according to Warren, um, you lag slightly behind the S&P 500 since joining uh, Berkshire. So uh, what recent changes, if any, have you implemented to uh, increase your odds of beating the S&P in your respective stock portfolios over the next 10 years? Yeah, I'm not sure whether Todd or Ted are here, but they, uh, I will tell you, but then I'll make this the final report on it. But on March 31st, actually, one is modestly ahead, one is modestly behind, but they are extraordinary managers. It has not been, it, it was a tough, it's been a tough period to beat the S&P, and like I say, one, one is now, uh, it is ahead of the S&P over that period once modestly behind. They've also helped us in, in just all kinds of ways. What, what, what Todd has done in connection with the medical initiative we have uh, with J.P. Morgan and Amazon, I mean, uh, I don't know how many hours a week he's worked totally on that. The, the things they brought to me, what, what Ted did in, in terms of the home capital group, uh, where we have essentially, uh, in a major way, well, we stabilized a financial institution that was under attack and experiencing runs in Canada, and he did the whole thing. I, uh, I heard about that on a Monday, and on Wednesday we put an offer before the company, and, and pr previously to that they probably had dozens and dozens of people combing over them, and, and meanwhile they were, they were struggling, and, and uh, you know, it was remarkable what he did, and, and, and I think it's appreciated. Uh, in the Toronto area. So um, we are enormously better off because the two are with us. And while we have that measurement, like I say, I, I, uh, I'll just put it this way, they're doing better than I am anyway. So if you ask me to report on them all the time, I'll have to report on myself all the time. And I'm not, <laughs> that would be embarrassing compared to how they do. They do very, they're very, very smart. They've been smart with their own money over over the years, they've been smart in running other people's money over the years, and they've made us a lot of money, but they made it during a market where you have made a lot of money in the S&P as well. Charlie? No, I'm fine. Okay, Becky? Uh, this question comes from Lidor Zluf, Yossi Zluf, and Dan Gorfung of Israel. And they write to, to both Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, do you think that Amex's share of mind is enough to win the credit cards race? How do you see Amex's competitive position now compared to the past? And who is the most threatening competitor now compared to the past? Yeah, everybody's a competitor, and including now Apple that has just instituted a, a uh, card, I guess, in conjunction with uh, Goldman Sachs. Everybody, there, there will always be in my view, many, many competitors in the business. Banks can't afford to leave the field. It's a growing field. They build up receivables on it. But I, I, wouldn't, think of a, I wouldn't think of the credit card business uh, as, one, as a one-model business any more than I would think of the car business uh, as essentially being one model. I mean, Ferrari is going to make a lot of money, but they're going to have just a portion of the market. Well, Amex, Amex is growing around the world with individuals, is growing around the world with small businesses. Uh, you just saw the contract they made with Delta, which is probably the ideal partner that runs, uh, what, for eight or nine, whatever it may be, nine or ten years, actually. Uh, it's, you know, the buildings go up per capita, they go up, they, the, the coverage spreads, uh, and they're going to have loads of competition, uh, and they always will. Uh, but they had, uh, 
you know, that, that's something uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, took on the platinum card and the, was a competitor and the platinum card had uh, highest renewal rates that they've had and they increased the price, I think, from 450 to $550 during a competitive battle and retention improved and new business improved and 68% or so the new business was was millennials. I mean, it it is a it is not an identical product with anything else. And, and as a premium card, it has a clientele which is large. It may only be it may be x it may be x percent of the market, maybe three quarters of x percent, or whatever it may be. It isn't it isn't for the person that likes to have five cards and look every day at which one provides the most rewards that day or in what gas stations or something of the sort but it's got a very large constituency that has a, a renewal rate, a usage rate that's the envy of everybody else in the industry. So I'm, I, uh, I like our American Express position uh, very well. Charlie? Charlie? Anything on no. American Express? No, I, <laughs> I think we own the world as long as the technology stays the same. Now we, it's an interesting thing. This I have year, no opinion about technology. This year, the technology is not, is not the whole thing. I mean, you know, it, 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 fortunately, I mean, it, uh, uh, if you look at credit card usage, uh, there are a lot of different things motivating different people to use different various types of payment systems. And there's a lot of them that are growing. There's some of them that are, uh, that are marginal and and American Express is an extraordinary operation. And I think this year, our share of the earnings, well, ne by next year, our share of the earnings of American Express will be equal to the cost of our position. We'll be earning 100% on what that position uh, cost us, and I think it will grow. But, uh, and I think the number of shares will go down and our interest will go up without us without us uh, laying out a dime. So it's, it's a... As you say, we own the world if it doesn't change. Well, even if it changes something. The world has changed a lot. American Express Co was formed in 1850. No, I'm talking about WeChat. You can talk about, you can talk about all kinds of competitors. But, yeah. <laughs> but the American Express actually was an express company formed in 1850, like I say, by Wells and Fargo, of all people. And... Uh, uh, you know, for a while they carried these big trunks around of valuables and, and then the railroads came along and that wasn't going to work very well anymore, so they went to the traveler's checks and, and it's a very interesting thing. In 1950, when I was living at 116th and Broadway, they were down at 65 Broadway and they were the most important name in travel. They were synonymous with the integrity of their traveler's checks. And the whole company, in a record year for travel, earned $3 million. $3 million, what, what a bond trader earns now in my lifetime. That's what they've done with, and they, their hand going in was the traveler's check, which has more or less disappeared, but the, the travelers, the American Express, uh, the power of that brand intelligently used going into the credit card business, where they entered much later than the Diners Club, later than carte blanche, but they came to dominate the luxury end of the, the credit card business. It's, it's a fantastic story, and, and uh, I'm glad we own 18% of it. Okay, Jay? I'm actually gonna ask something about Occidental Petroleum. I'm surprised it hasn't been asked yet. So, Berkshire is committed to providing $10 billion of financing in the, in the form of an 8% preferred share and attached warrants for Occidental's proposed acquisition of Anadarko. This is the first time Berkshire is committed to such a large preferred share investment since the acquisition of Heinz in 2013. What did you find attractive about the Occidental deal in terms of its business and should we expect other large financing transactions in the future as a way for Berkshire to deploy a portion of its excess cash? I don't think the Occidental transaction will be the last one we do. <laughs> there may be one 
you know, in a month, there may be not, there may be one, three or four years from now, it won't be identical. I hope it's larger. But the point is, we, <clears throat> we're very likely to get the call because we can do something that really, <clears throat> I don't think, no institution can do it. I mean, they've got committees that have to pass on it and they want to have so-called MAC clauses, material adverse changes, they want to do this and that. And uh, uh, if somebody wants a lot of certain money for a deal, uh, you know, they've seen that I can get a call on Friday afternoon and, on, and they can make a date with me on Saturday and on Sunday it's done. And uh, they absolutely know that they have $10 billion and we're not going to tell them how to structure their transaction or do anything else. They, they've got it. And there will be times uh, in the future when something not identical but similar comes along and, and we're the one to call. And I hope it's larger than $10 billion. Uh, uh, it could be, it could be we'll do, you know, in the next five years, it could be we'll do a lot of money, additional money and things similar to this, not identical. And it could be that nothing will happen. But, but if there are any $10 billion or $20 billion or maybe even $50 billion two-day transactions, that are in the world. Believe me, they'll think of Berkshire Hathaway for sure in terms of what number to call. Charlie? Well, I like it. <laughs> I called Charlie as soon as we made the deal. I called Ron Olson first because I was worried that he might have a conflict. Uh, uh, and in about 10 minutes he had, I told him we, it had to be done by Monday night and Cravath was being told the same thing uh, by Occidental, and it was very light on, on Monday night, but, but all the papers were put in order, and Munger Tolls was in Los Angeles, and Corbath was in New York, and I was in Omaha, and I didn't do that much. Mark Hamburg did a lot, a lot of the work. He was at work on Sunday on other things when I went down to, to uh, meet with the Occidental people, and uh, uh, it, it was the product of, of people who understood us, understood how we operate, and uh, uh, both with an incentive to, to put all the manpower on, on necessary on, 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 on the job. And like I say, they're, they're, I think their board of directors met at 10 o'clock on Monday night to approve it, but they could announce it Tuesday morning, and that's what they wanted to do. And, and with Berkshire, they could do it. Okay, station six. Good afternoon. My name is Tony McCall, and I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. And my question is about your discipline risk evaluation approach and how you balance that with the fact that perseverance and determination and grit are often necessary for, su for success. Well, I'm not, <clears throat> I certainly like determination and grit in the, in the, with the people we work for, but we, we don't have any formula that evaluates risk, but we, we certainly, we certainly make a, our own calculation of risk versus reward in every transaction we do. And, uh, it's true whether it's marketable securities, that's true whether it's private investments, that's true whether it's making an investment in a business. And sometimes we're wrong, and we're gonna be wrong sometimes in the future. You can't make a lot of decisions in this business without being wrong, but we don't think the procedure or the results would be changed favorably by having lots of committees and lots of spreadsheets and, 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 and that sort of thing. It just uh, uh, you know, if I had a group under me, they would try and figure out what I wanted the answer to be, and they would tell me what I wanted to hear. And I've watched that approach at, at 20 public companies, and, and uh, what the CEO wants to do, they, they may spend a lot of time getting there, but, uh, but the investment banker gets there, and the internal uh, 
committees get there or the internal operations get there. The calculations are it's the same as the insurance business with a G. A G gets calls on insurance deals, and you have to think through that deal. The main thing is, yeah, are you reasonably sure that you know what you're doing? And uh, uh, it gets past that hurdle, then we go on to figure out the math of, of uh, gain versus loss and how much loss we can afford to take in anything. And we're willing to take what sound like large losses if we think that the rewards are, are more likely and, and proportional. Charlie? I've got nothing. Yeah, it's very disappointing. We have no formulas around Berkshire. We, we, don't, we don't sit down and, and write a bunch, you know, uh, have people work till midnight calculating things and putting, putting spreadsheets together. And, and if the hurdle rate is 15% or something, having them all come out at 15.1 or 15.2, because that's what's going to happen. I mean, it's, you're going you're gonna to get the numbers you want to hear to an extreme degree. And, uh, uh, the, the proposals we receive from the investment world, I've got to tell you about one because it, 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 uh, it illustrates go on. We received a proposition the other day, and I'll disguise the numbers a little bit so nobody uh, can pick it out. But it was a private company, and we'll say it was earning $100 million a year. But the seller of the business and the investment banker suggested that we should look at the earnings as being $110 million a year because as a private company, they had to pay their top people in cash, which was expensed, but we could pay them in stock options and things like that, which weren't expensed or were explained as not really counting, and therefore we would, could report $110 million if we gave away something we didn't want to give away. But by essentially by by sort of lying about our accounting, we could add $10 million to the earning, and they wanted us to pay them because they couldn't do it, and we could do it, and therefore, at this point, they're losing me, of course, <laughs> totally, but it, it's just astounding the, the accounting games that are played. All the adjustments are why the place should really be, will be earning more than before. It's, it's, it's a business. We also had one that came in from a private equity firm, and by a mistake, uh, we got the email that was sent to the manager from the email from the private equity firms that owned it to the manager in terms of making projections for it. And they told them to add 15% because they say Buffett will discount it by 15% or 20% anyway. So just, just to add 15% to offset his conservatism. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not an elegant business, as Charlie will tell you. <laughs> You have any better stories, Charlie? <laughs> it's bad enough. <laughs> okay, Andrew. It's really very bad enough. Thank you, Warren. I think it's why do we want our leading citizens lying and cheating? Andrew, um, I believe this is my final question, and admittedly, it's a two-parter, but it's the same topic. Uh, Elon Musk says that Tesla will start to offer insurance for its cars and can price it better than a typical insurance company because of the data it collects from all the vehicles on the road. You've talked about the threat of autonomous vehicles on the insurance business, but what about the threat to GEICO of automobile companies themselves getting into the insurance business? And on a very similar topic, Tesla recently announced that they're shifting to an online-only sales model, and several traditional auto dealerships are also reducing their property holdings as car buyers increasingly use smartphones and the internet to shop for cars. What does this portend for Berkshire Hathaway Automotive? Yeah. Uh, actually, General Motors had a company for a long time called Motors Insurance Company, and, and various companies have tried it. I would say that uh, uh, the success of of the insurance company of the auto companies getting into the insurance business are probably about as likely as the success of the insurance companies getting into the auto business. Uh, it, it, it uh, I worry much more about progressive than all of the auto company possibilities that I could see in terms of getting insurance business. It's, it's not an easy business uh, at all. And uh, uh, I would bet against any company in the auto business being any kind of a out, 
uh, of an unusual success. The idea of using telematics in terms of studying people, studying people's drivers' habits, that's, that's spreading quite, quite uh, widely, and uh, uh, it, is an important, it is important to have data on how people drive, how hard they brake, how much they swerve, all kinds of things. Uh, so I don't doubt the value of the data, but I don't think that the, the auto companies will have any, any advantage to that. I don't think they'll make money in the insurance business. The, uh, using the internet to shop for cars is like, you know, using the internet for shopping for everything. It's another competitor. And uh, uh, there's no question that people will look for better ways. Now, the gross margin on new cars, on new cars, is about 6% or thereabouts. So there's, there's, there's not lots of room in the game, but, but that's, that will be a method and that will sell some cars. And if there are, you know, it, it, it's, it's another competitor. But, uh, but I don't think it, it destroys the auto dealer who takes good care of the customers and is, is there to service the customers. And no, uh, it, it, it's, not a, it's not an overwhelming threat, but it's obviously something that's going to be around and will sell some cars. Charlie? Again, nothing. Okay. Greg. Warren, a lot of Berkshire's success over the years has come from the fact that you and Charlie have had the luxury of being patient, waiting for the right opportunities to come along to put excess capital to work, even if it has led to a buildup of large amounts of cash on the balance sheet. This has historically worked out well for shareholders as you and Charlie have been able to take full advantage of the disruptions in equity and credit markets or special situations like we saw with the Oxy deal to negotiate deals on terms that ultimately benefit Berkshire shareholders. That said, there is an opportunity cost attached to your decision to hold on to so much cash, one that investors have been willing to bear, primarily by foregoing a return of excess capital as dividends and share purchases, as well as seeing lower returns on cash holdings. As we look forward, how certain can we be that this will still be the case once you're no longer running the show, especially if Berkshire's returns are expected to be lower over time, and is it not more likely that the next managers of Berkshire will have to manage the eventual migration of Berkshire from an acquisition and investment platform to a returning capital to shareholders' vehicle? Yeah. Well, that's certainly a possibility. I mean, that's a possibility under me. It's a possibility under the successor. I mean, it's a question of can you invest truly large sums reasonably well? You can't do it as well as you can do small sums, so there's no question about that. But uh, uh, we will have to see how that works out over many years because certain years, lots of opportunities, huge opportunities present themselves and, and other years are, are totally dry holes. So uh, that's not a judgment you can make in a one-year period or a three-year period. It's certainly a judgment you can make over time though. And, and I personally, my estate will, will uh, have basically nothing but Berkshire in it uh, for some time as it gets to dispersed to philanthropies. And I'm, I have a section in there which says uh, to the trustees, in effect, who manage it. I, I, have, a tr I have a section in there that says, uh, ignore the, uh, you're, or you're, you're, you're exempt, as, from my standpoint, uh, from the law that trustees normally should diversify and do all of that sort of thing. And I, I want the, entire amount that they have to be kept in Berkshire as they distribute it over time to the philanthropies. And I don't worry at all about the fact. I, I would like to have a very large sum go to the philanthropies, and I, I don't worry at all about the fact that it essentially will all be in Berkshire. And I'm willing to make that decision while I'm alive, which will continue for some years after I die. So I have a lot of confidence in the ability of the Berkshire culture to endure and that we have the right people to make sure that that happens. But I'm betting my entire net worth on that, uh, and uh, and that doesn't give me pause at all. I rewrite my will every few years, and I write it. I write it the same way in respect to the Berkshire Holdings. Charlie. Oh, I don't own any indexes, and I have always been willing to be own just two or three stocks, and. I have not minded that everybody who teaches finance in uh, law school and business school teaches that what I'm doing is wrong. It isn't wrong. It's worked beautifully. 
uh, I don't think you need a portfolio of 50 stocks if you know what you're doing. And I hope my heirs will just sit. My heirs hope that I'll change my will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Station 7. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. My name is Bill He, and I'm from Vancouver, Canada. You two make up an iconic duo, and growing up, I found your investment strategies very admirable. And so my question is, how do you deal with conflicts when they arise between the two of you? Are you applying personal conflicts in terms of doing something ourselves versus having Berkshire do it, or, or uh, oh, between the two of you, I'm just, uh, uh, Charlie and I, literally, and people find this hard to believe, but in 60 years, we've never had an argument. We have disagreed about things, and we'll probably keep occasionally disagreeing about this or that, but if you define an argument as something where emotion starts entering into it or uh, uh, anger or anything of the sort, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen. I, I think that uh, Charlie is smarter than I am, but I also think that there are certain things where I've spent more time on them than he has, and, and sometimes we both think we're right, and generally I get my way because Charlie is willing to do it that way, and he's never second-guessed me when things have been wrong, and I wouldn't dream of second-guessing him if he were doing something that was wrong, so it turned out to be wrong. It, we, we, we will we'll never have a conflict, basically. Charlie? Well, the issue is how long how we get along. The issue is how is it going to work when we're gone? And the answer is fine. It's going to work fine. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky that, you know, I ran into him when I was, what, 28 years old. And I, and I both worked in the same grocery, grocery store and they grew up less than a block away from where I now live and everything, but I did not know who Charlie Munger was until I was 28. But, uh, but clearly we're in, in sync in how we see the world and we're in sync on business decisions, basically. Charlie would do fewer things than I would, but that's because I'm spending my time on this while he's designing dormitories or something. And we both, we both keep busy in our own ways and we have a lot of fun uh, dividing the labor like we do. But... Uh, you really, you really want to work. I mean, having the right partners in life, particularly the right spouse, but particularly having the right partners in life is enormously important. I mean, it just, it's, it's more fun with a partner, both in personal life and, and, and in business life, and, and you probably get more accomplished too, but you just have a better time. It would not be any fun to do work in a little room and make a ton of money trading around securities, but never never working with another human being. So uh, I recommend finding, well, Charlie gave some advice in the movie, finding well, the, best, the best person will have you or something like that. It, yeah. uh, <laughs> sort of a limited objective. Uh, but it's but, not hard to be happy if you're a collector and don't run out of money. Collecting is intrinsically fun. Just think, who? how many people who you know in your whole life who were collectors who didn't run out of money who weren't happy collecting. That's what we've been collecting all our lives. It's a very interesting thing. There's always a new rock to be turned over. and It's interesting. Yeah, in a certain way we've collected friends that make our lives better and that we have a good time with. And uh, it's, it's very important you know, the who you select as your heroes or your friends. And, and uh, I've, I've been lucky in this. I mean, it was only because of a doctor named Eddie Davis and his wife that Charlie and I even met. And, but if you, if you keep doing enough things, some will work out very lucky. And, and uh, the best ones are ones that involve lifelong involvement with, with other people. But, uh, and uh, we've got some in our, some of our directors, a number of our directors that have had similar impacts on me. So I, uh, I recommend that, uh, that uh, you look for somebody better than you are and then try to be like they are. It's funny, you know, we've lost people along the way. And 
when I lost Warren's secretary, I thought, my God, she was so wonderful, Gladys. We'll never get another one. Becky is better. <laughs> and then we, we had Bird McKenzie, who was a wonderful chief financial officer. He's gone, to the, and the incurrent incumbent is better. We've been very lucky. And maybe the shareholders will be lucky a few more times. Okay, station eight. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. My name is Jacob. I'm a shareholder from China and also a proud graduate of Columbia Business School. Thanks for having us here. <laughs> My question is, our world is changing at a faster pace today versus 40 years ago, and even more so going forward. Under this context, for each of us individually, shall we expand our circle of competence continuously over time, or shall we stick with the existing circle but risk having a shrinking investment universe? Thank you. Well, obviously, you should, under any conditions, you should expand your circle of competence. If you can. If you can. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, uh, I've expanded mine a little bit over time. If but you can't, you ought to be pretty cautious. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you can't force it, you know. It, if you told me that I had to, you know, become an expert on on physics or, you know. Dance may be the lead in the ballet, Warren. That would be a sight. Yeah, well, that's one of that that really now. That's one you may be thinking about, but I, that didn't even occur to me. But, no, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean you can't expand it at all. I mean, I, I, I did learn about some things as I've gone along in, in, the, in the few businesses. In some cases, I've learned that, we're, that I'm incompetent, which is actually a plus, and you've discarded that one. Uh, but it doesn't really have, the world is going to change. It's going to keep changing. It's changing every day, and that, that, that makes it interesting. You know, it, uh, and and, and uh, as, it, as it changes, certainly within what you think is your present existing circle, you, have to, you should be the master of figuring that one out, or, or it really isn't your circle of competence. And if you get a chance to expand it somewhat as you go along, I've learned some about the energy business from Walter and, and Greg as, as we work together, but I'm not close to their level of competence on it. But I, I do know more than I used to know. And so you get a chance to expand it a bit. Usually, I would, I would think normally your core competence is probably something that sort of fits the way the mind is working. Some people have what I call a money mind, and they, they will work well in certain types of money situations. Uh, it isn't so much a question of IQ. The mind is a very strange thing. Uh, and people have specialties, whether in chess or bridge, I see it in different person. People that can do impossible, what seem to me impossible things, and they're really kind of, as Charlie would say, stupid in other areas. <laughs> so uh, just keep working on it. Don't, don't think you have to increase it and therefore start bending the rules. Anything further, Charlie? No. Station nine. We're just about. Yeah, we got time for a couple more. My name is John Durso, and I'm from New York. Mr. Buffett, you've said that you could return 50% per annum if you were managing a $1 million portfolio. What type of strategy would you use? Would you invest in cigar butts, i.e. average businesses at very cheap prices, or would it be some type of arbitrage strategy? Thank you. It might well be the arbitrage strategy, but in a very different, perhaps, way than, than customary arbitrage is thought of. But one way or another, I can assure you, if Charlie was working with a million, or I was working with a million, we would find a way to make that with, with essentially uh, no risk, not using a lot of leverage or anything of the sort. But you change the one million to a hundred million, and that fifty goes down like a like a rock. That uh, uh, there are little fringe inefficiencies that people don't don't spot, and you do get opportunities occasionally to do, but but they don't really have any applicability to Berkshire. So, Charlie, well, I agree totally. It's just. What, you used to say that large amounts of money, they 
develop their own anchors. Yeah. You, you just, it's, it gets harder and harder. I've just seen genius after genius with a great record, and pretty soon they got 30 billion and two floors of young men, and away goes the good record. It's just the way it works. But it's hard as the money goes up. When Charlie was a lawyer, initially, I mean, you were developing a couple of real estate projects. Or, I mean, you find, if you really want to make a million dollars, or 50% on a million, and you're willing to work at it, and uh, you'll find, that's, that's doable, but it just has no applicability to managing huge sums. So, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Yeah, Lee Lu, using nothing but the float on his student loans, had a million dollars practically shortly after he graduated as a total scholarship student. He, he found just a few things to do yeah. and did them. Okay, station 10. Hello, Warren, Charlie. Um, I'm Luis Cobo from Panama. I'm a pr proud Berkshire Hathaway shareholder since 10 years ago. And um, I've been looking at CIS candies, and I'm a pretty good fan of them. And I see Charlie's as well through our meeting. Um, and even with all our consumption, and you know, the company has given us generous profits over the past decades, what do you think the company has not grown to the scale of Mars or Hershey's, and what do you think we could do to make this company you know, grow and become a bigger part of our company, being such an amazing product? Well, we've probably had a dozen or so ideas over the years, and we used to really focus on it because it was much small, a much more sizable part of our business. In fact, it was practically our only business aside from insurance. And uh, like I say, we've had 10 or 12 ideas. Some of them we've tried more than once, and as we've had a new manager, they've tried them, and, and the truth is none of them really work. And uh, uh, the business is extraordinarily good in a very small niche. Box chocolates are something that everybody likes to receive, or maybe give as a gift, both sides of it, and relatively few of the people uh, go out and buy to consume themselves. Uh, if, if I leave a box of chocolates open at the office, we've only got 25 people, but it's gone, you know, almost immediately. If I take it as a gift to somebody, they're happy to get it. But, uh, and, and if you leave the box open at a dinner party, again, they're all gone. But those same people that so readily grab it when it's right there in front of them do not walk out to a candy store very often. And, and buy it just to eat themselves. They're not going to buy it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very much a gift product. It does, not, it does not grow worldwide. Very interesting thing. People in, at least the last time I checked, people in the West prefer dark, milk chocolate. People in the East prefer dark chocolate. People in the West like big, chunky pieces. People in the East will take miniatures. And, and it's, it's, we, we've tried to move it geographically many, 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 many times, because it would be so wonderful if it, when it works, it works wonderfully, and, but it, it, it doesn't travel that well. We, if we open a store in the east, we get enormous traffic for a while, and everybody says, we've been waiting for you to come, and then it finally, we end up with a store that does X pounds per year when we need one and a half X uh, in the same square footage, to make terrific returns, and and uh, we we've tried everything because the the math is so good when it works, and overall we have a business that doesn't doesn't grow. Chocolate consumption generally doesn't doesn't grow that much, but yeah, obviously, but yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, well, we fail in turning our little candy company into Mars or Hershey's. The same reason that you failed to get the Nobel Prize in Physics and achieve immortality. <laughs> it's too tough for us. But we put $25 million into it, and it's given us over $2 billion of pre-tax income, well over $2 billion. 
and we've used it to buy other businesses. And if, if, we'd, if we were the typical company and had bought that business and tried desperately to make, use all the retained earnings within the candy business, I think we'd have fallen on our face. I think that it, it just illustrates that all these formulas you, you, know, you learn or that, that you know, having a strategic plan to use all the capital. So some businesses work in a fairly limited area. Others really play out over. This Dr. Pepper, you know, has a, I don't know what the, what the percentage is now, but it might be a 10 or 12% market share or something like that in, in Dallas, or maybe it's eight, but, and then you go to Detroit or Boston, and it's, it's, it's less than 1%. I'm not sure about the numbers currently, but, but you'd think in a mobile society, you know, with Dr. Pepper having been around since the time Coke was founded in 1886, uh, it, it's amazing how certain things travel, certain things don't travel. At, uh, you know, the candy bars, you mentioned uh, Hershey. I mean, Cadbury doesn't do that well here, and Hershey doesn't necessarily do that well in the UK, and here we are, we all look alike, but somehow we eat different candy bars. And we, it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting to observe, and the idea that you have some formula for businesses that provide that each one should pursue uh, the course they're on because they made it in X, they should try to find other ways to make it in X. We're quite willing to find it in A, B, C, D, E, or F, which is like the money is fungible. And uh, I think actually it's worked very much to our advantage to have that philosophy. So, anything further, Charlie? I once told a very great man at dinner after he'd written a very great book, I said, you know, you're never going to write another great book like that. And he was deeply offended. And I've read his four subsequent bits and I, books, and I'm totally right. To write one great book is a lot to do in one lifetime. And the people aren't holding back on you when they don't do more. It's hard. But you ought to make the most of the one first one you got. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're lucky, you know. And, uh, yes, and we were we were very fortunate. Yeah. I would have blown the chance to buy C's candy, uh, but Charlie uh, Charlie said, "Don't be so cheap, basically." And and we still we still got it at a pretty good price. <laughs> and, and we it's learned a lot. It's amazing how much we have learned over the years. Yeah, we and if we hadn't, the record would be so much worse. Yeah. yeah. At any given time, what we already knew was not going to be enough to take us to the next step. That's what makes it difficult. Think of all the people you know that have tried to take one extra step and have fallen off a cliff. Well, on that happy note, we will conclude the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank you, but save, save some of it for next year. We may need it then. So, that, yeah, just, just give us a carry forward on the rest of it. And thank you. We'll come back at 3.45. We will conduct the business of the meeting. And uh, it, it doesn't, we have no, uh, uh, nothing on the proxy to vote on, but we will be back here in 15 minutes. And uh, if you enjoy a process, you can stick around and watch us reelect our board. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>